Greetings and welcome to another exciting edition of Poet to Poet. I'm Robert Dunn. I'm the host of this extravaganza. And it is an extravaganza because uh, we've traveled all the way up to the far north, Massachusetts specifically, to visit with X.J. Kennedy, who has been uh, famous for a number of decades for his poetry and other good stuff, which we'll get into. Uh, before I introduce uh, XJ to all you lucky people out there, I want to mention a few things. Uh, I have a, finally have a new book out called Zanyentes in Bondage, which is put out by Cross Cultural Literary Editions, Stanley H. Barkin Publisher. And Poet the Poet also puts out Medicinal Purposes, which is our literary journal. And in the short time that we've been publishing, we've gotten a lot of respect and uh, even a couple subscribers, which we're very pleased about. And we've apparently made such a good impression that we can actually get people of the caliber of X.J. Kennedy into the magazine. As a matter of fact, in this, in this issue, we have him as a centerpiece. We've given him uh, about six pages worth of uh, space to put in all kinds of material. And if I can just remember what I did with his bio, we put it in the magazine, too. So... Let's uh, get into that. He is one of today's finest poets. He calls himself, and you'll find out why in a moment if you haven't read him yet. And if you haven't, shame on you. He's one of an endangered species, uh, people who still write in meter and rhyme. And he's got credentials that would take the entire show to get through. And we just might. But briefly, his first uh, collection was New Descending a Staircase, put out by Doubleday in 1961. Winner of the Lamont Award of the American, uh, excuse me, the Academy of American Poets, or vice versa. And let's see, he's also written textbooks such as An Introduction to Poetry, Little Brown in 1966. Um, let's see, eight editions? Yeah, going into a ninth. Uh, with Dana Joya, mm -hmm. uh, as I understand. Let's see, uh, you were professor of English at Tufts, and you've also taught at the University of Michigan. University of California at Irvine, uh, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and Wellesley College. And if that's not enough for you, uh, besides uh, the adult books, um, I don't mean that they're dirty, it's just the, they're, <laughs> they're for, for grown-up audiences, and the textbooks uh, for students of all ages, uh, X.J. Kennedy has also written a number of children's books, and uh, all kinds all kinds of goodies, and uh, we're very excited to uh, to have him here, and we get to call him Joe, as a matter of fact. So, Joe, welcome to Poet the Poet. Thank you, Robert. Uh, what did I leave out? Oh, not much. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right. Um, do you want to start with the adult stuff or the kitty stuff? Well, uh, we could start with the adult and, and work our way down, maybe. Uh, Sometimes I think it would be working our way up, but... Uh, <laughs> Because it's trickier, to, much trickier to write for the kids, I think, than for the uh, for the adults. So, what have you got? You've got cross ties over there, I see. Uh, well, uh, would you like uh, a poem? Sure. Oh, okay. Here's an old short one mm -hmm. with an unoriginal title. It's called "Nude Descending a Staircase," and uh, that that is a, a title swiped and an idea swiped from uh, the French Cubist poet. Uh, I mean, painter, Marcel Duchamp. Toe upon toe, a snowing flesh, a gold of lemon, root and rind. She sifts in sunlight down the stairs with nothing on, nor on her mind. We spy beneath the banister a constant thresh of thigh on thigh. Her lips imprint the swinging air that parts to let her parts go by. One woman waterfall, she wears her slow descent like a long cape and pausing on the final stair collects her motions into shape. And the shape that uh, she chose was something of a cube, as I recall. Yeah, in Duchamp's painting, uh, the nude looked like uh, a couple of decks of cards being shuffled fast, uh, uh, or some frames of an animated cartoon, uh, mm -hmm. all superimposed, trying to convey motion, I guess mm -hmm. he was. 
Yeah, it's it's funny because uh, Chuck Jones, the animator, not the shoe fetishist, um, did a parody painting of it with Daffy Duck. <laughs> believe it or not, huh. a, a new duck descending <clears throat> uh, scarecase. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember exactly where he put the banana peel that started Daffy Duck descending, but uh, <laughs> it's that sort of thing. Do you get much inspiration from uh, from the fine arts, quote unquote, or rather the fine visual arts, I should say, because the poetry here is definitely fine art. Well, uh, you get your inspiration where you can, you know. Sometimes mm -hmm. I find mine in the gutter. You, you never know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's where I find most of my loose change, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, gutter poems? Oh, well, uh, well, I have that ballad, but... Or, or oh, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back we'll to come that. Come back, okay. back to that. Yeah. All right. I'm, if we go yeah. bowling later, I'll show you a lot of gutter balls, but that's... Uh, uh, okay, that's, well, that, that's thing. something else. Okay, what else is in Cross Ties? Oh, well... Uh, How long did it take to uh, accumulate the poems for Cross Ties? I understand that you collected works. It's a, it's a selection that mm -hmm. takes in stuff for about um, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one more from it. Yeah. Uh, here's one about heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. uh, Two of my old neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> Which one were you born in? <clears throat> uh, I'll let the audience decide that one. Um, it's called Nothing in Heaven Functions as It Ought. And uh, the first part of the poem is a picture of heaven, and then the second part is a picture of hell. Nothing in heaven functions as it ought. Peter's bifocals blindly sat on crack. His gates lurch wide with a cackle like a cock, not turn with a hush of gold as Milton had thought. Gangs of the slaughtered innocents keep huffing the nimbus off the venerable bead like that of an old dandelion gone to seed. And the beatific choir keeps breaking up, coughing. But hell, sleek hell, hath no freewheeling part. None takes his own sweet time, none quickens pace. Ask anyone, how come you here, poor heart? and he will slot a quarter through his face. You'll hear an instant click. A tear will start, imprinted with an abstract of his case. Which probably explains why the rents are higher in hell. I uh, wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the good maintenance men go, I shouldn't say things like that. I'll never get my apartment serviced again when this gets out. Um, Joe, um, everything that, uh, that I've read about you covers the period after you started publishing books and writing the textbooks and doing all that other marvelous stuff. Um, but how did you get to the point where you could get your first book published? Well, it was sheer luck, Robert. I had uh, saved up a stash of poems that I had mostly written while I was an enlisted man in the Navy. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of time on my hands. I had a the softest job of my life, which was to uh, shoot pictures of sailors for their hometown newspaper. Uh, and uh, when, I, I, when I left the Navy, I went to Michigan as a grad student, and uh, uh, I won a, a, a student poetry contest, and by a stroke of luck, uh, a literary agent uh, happened to come to town, and she tried selling my manuscript, and she didn't get any place. But then, by a stroke of even better luck, she became an editor herself and accepted the book. Ah. <laughs> In other words, it's not what you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> but who you know? <laughs> well, in that case, I guess it was. Ah, uh, for the rest of us, the minute a literary agent walks in the room and hears poet, ah, uh, they run screaming off into the night. Yeah, well, my I have a literary agent at present, but uh, he doesn't handle poetry. He, he <laughs> figures there's no money in it. Mm -hmm. Probably true. Probably true. Um, so that was graduate school and then the military. But before that. 
um, as an undergraduate or even in high school, uh, did you happen to um, run into any situations that uh, that gave you an inkling that you would be following the muse to this extent? Not really. Uh, I wasn't much interested in poetry when I was in grade school and early high school. Uh, all the English teachers at the time seemed to assume that all the poets had died about the year 1800, mm -hmm. and uh, they seemed only to like very long poems about King Arthur, which uh, did not wow me at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I took a while to get into poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess in college I had a couple of good teachers yeah. that helped. I keep running backwards in time with you because I want to... Uh, get into some of the kids' poems, uh, maybe one or two of the brats. Yeah, well, that's uh, something that came uh, more recently. Uh, I started uh, doing poems for little kids, yeah. mm -hmm. which is, you know, a much different scene. Uh, you read your poems to an adult audience, and usually uh, they sit there politely mm -hmm. and take it, but you go into a third grade, yeah. read your poems to little kids. If they're bored, you know, they, they get up and run around. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I uh, read short poems to them sometimes, hear what they are writing. Before we break, I'd yeah. like to do a short poem. Okay, well, here's one uh, called Mother's Nerves. A small boy is talking. My mother said, If just once more I hear you slam that old screen door, I'll tear out my hair, I'll dive in the stove. So I gave it a bang, and in she dove. <laughs> well, there are brats and there are brats. We'll be having more brats and other exciting stuff from X.J. Kennedy in just a moment, but we're going to take a brief pause, so don't go away.